A lot of movies came out this summer, and I'm yet to talk about any of them. So, what is going on everybody? My name is Ian, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be going over every film this summer of interest because I've been gone for a long time, and it's really important that you guys know my brief thoughts on these respective films. It's important to note that for the vast majority of these films, I will make separate video essay format videos at some point in time, but I just wanted to get my brief thoughts out today since it's been a while, I think it's important you know. Yeah. Okay, I gotta I gotta stop talking and blabbering on because we have not one, not two, not three, not four, not six, but five movies to cover today. So let's get into it. Oh, also, there will be no spoilers in this video for any of the following films. And like I said, I'll be making separate videos. So at that point in time, we'll be able to talk about spoilers. First off, we have Avengers Infinity War. This film is kind of the culmination of everything the MCU has ever been leading up to. For those of you who don't know, when I say MCU, I mean Marvel Cinematic Universe. The antagonist in this film is, of course, Thanos, and he is a threat we've known about since the end credit scene of the Avengers all the way back in 2012, which was actually my first MCU movie. And my first PG-13 movie. The MCU changed my life in lots of ways. Walking into the film, I tried to set my expectations low. I knew there were so many characters the film had to focus on, and I wasn't sure how they were going to handle that. It was a balancing act like the MCU had never had to handle before. Sure, we'd gotten Civil War with tons of characters, we'd gotten all the Avengers movies with several characters, but we were also adding on top of that all the new characters and the Guardians of the Galaxy. It, it was... I was very worried about this thing. I... I... I hoped it wasn't going to be, but I figured it was probably going to be a mess. Luckily, I was wrong. It was not at all a mess. Somehow, Marvel managed to mend these characters together and to pull off this story, and it was really just kind of insane. Walking out of the theater the first time, I treated it as more of a cinematic experience as opposed to a film, simply because there's not much of a concrete plot. Except when I watched it again at home recently, I realized that there is a huge theme that ties everything together, and it's really changed my whole perspective on the film, and I'm glad I'd seen it again and comprehended it better before I made this video, so that way I can tell you that it does have a plot and a theme. But I'm gonna save that for the video essay that I talk about at some point for Infinity War because there's this awesome theme and I can't wait to dive into it. The best thing about this film, besides the fact that we're getting to see all these characters mingle together, are the visuals. The MCU has suffered before with gray and bland movies. I'm thinking Civil War or really most of the MCU movies up until a point, up until like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I mean, the MCU is kind of infamous for this darkening of things. Not as infamous as the DCEU, but still there's a lot of sort of complaints about how bland it is, but Infinity War does not have this problem at all. Of course, this focuses on the Infinity Stones, and so there's that whole thing with color, and it, it really works. This was even more prevalent in the merchandise and the advertising, but it's still in the film as well, which I was happy to see. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Now, with Civil War, I actually love that film, but at the same time, I never want to watch it because of how gray it is, actually. Like, that actually plays a part. I think that's why I'm usually disinterested in Captain America Civil War. But with Infinity War, I'm always going to watch it just because of how much of a visual treat it is. It's... It takes the visuals of the MCU to a whole new level. And of course, the action sequences are insane. We got heroes with all sorts of different powers playing a part, trying to take down Thanos. And the Battle of Wakanda, which no spoilers, of course, but like, there are just so many sequences in this film that are going to take your breath away. I think I'm kind of so used to these sequences in films that it really, I mean, it does push the standards of what we've seen, but at the same time, it's, I mean, this is kind of everywhere in films now, but if you really sit back and think about it, it's kind of amazing. No, it is amazing. If I were to complain about one thing, it would be the Marvel humor. Now, don't get me wrong, I laughed out loud 800 million times in this movie, and some jokes worked perfectly, but other times it's just really inappropriate. And I don't mean, like, middle school jokes. I mean, like, the timing. And I know there's lots of discussions with this online, lots of video essays covering the fact that Marvel uses humor in inappropriate ways sometimes. Sometimes, Marvel, it's just better if you don't crack a joke. That's all I'm saying. So, yeah, I did love this film a lot and totally recommend it, especially if you're a Marvel fan. Like, well, if you're a Marvel fan, heck yes, you saw it already. No, but for real, it's just such a extravaganza. That's probably the best word to describe it. Next up, <laughs> representing May, we got Star Wars A Story Solo. Han Solo is actually one of my favorite film characters of all time. There's just so much to love. I was a bit nervous to see someone other than Harrison Ford portray him, but the best part of this movie, without a doubt, is Alden Ehrenreich's portrayal. He's so new and he's so different, but at the same time, he honors the old 
and he is Harrison Ford, but at the same time, he's not Harrison Ford, and it's just this really good combination and culmination and mixture that gives us really just... <laughs> Alden does an amazing job, is the point. Another thing to talk about in this movie is the score. Solo is only the second Star Wars movie where John Williams did not compose the entirety of the score. In Rogue One, he didn't compose any of it. It was strictly Michael Giacchino, which we'll get to him later when we talk a certain movie. This time, the composer was John Powell, although John Williams did write the theme for the film. And I just love the score. Some would call it forgettable, but I've listened to it too many times on Spotify and on YouTube now and while I'm doing work and junk. Like, it's just kind of ingrained in my mind and it is Han now. It's it's great. Infus Nest is good. No spoilers, though. She's just really a great addition to the Star Wars universe. Okay, so in Infinity War, at a certain part without spoiling it, I was crying tears. Although they were forced tears. Where with Solo, there was a part where I was crying genuine happy tears. This movie felt so very original trilogy. Now, of course, there was the whole boycotting thing where a bunch of whiny fanboys, if you even want to call them fan, you might as well just call them a bunch of whiny boys. The point is, The Last Jedi did not sit well with the vast majority of the Star Wars community, and so that led a lot of them to say, oh, we're not going to see Solo, which ended up making Solo have the worst box office opening for a Star Wars film ever. And that's really unfortunate, because it's one of the best ever, in my opinion. And I feel like all the people who were boycotting it because The Last Jedi didn't feel like Star Wars, this felt so original trilogy. Dare I say, the most original trilogy anything coming out of Disney has felt ever. They missed such an amazing film. Now, the part where I was crying genuine happy tears was the assault on Kessel, which again, no spoilers, but yeah. It's a specific scene and the visuals are there, like coming up with visuals again, and it was just colorful, the only colorful part of the movie, which we'll get to that in a minute, but the, the music and the way the characters were exchanging dialogue, I mean, there was just so much to love about this particular scene, and I, I mean, I wasn't like crying, but I was tearing up because it was just such a happy moment. Okay, we've talked We've praised it quite a bit, so, Ian, there has to be something wrong with this film. Yes, there's, there are a couple things, actually. First of all, this movie suffers from what I was talking about other previous MCU movies suffered from, which was, it was just super bland. The difference here, though, is that it actually kind of fits the theme. Of course, we're talking about the nitty-gritty side of the Star Wars universe, smugglers and bounty hunters and scum, so, of course, there's got to be that sort of grittier feel. So, it, it gets a pass but it still makes it something that I wouldn't necessarily, like, think of wanting to go back and watch. But of course I will because of, like, Olden Ehrenreich and certain scenes. It's just, like... <sighs> so the advertising run for this film was actually very colorful, and one of my favorite marketing campaigns for a Star Wars film, at least that I've been alive for. I just loved the retro look and the western look and the colorful look. There were all these colors going about, but then in the movie, the only part that's really like that is my favorite scene, the assault on Kessel. I can't really get into certain additions to canon or changes to canon because that would fall under the spoilers category, so I'm not gonna get into that today, but I'll probably end up making a separate video about it at some point. So let's get into what my one other problem with the movie that doesn't involve spoilers. Actually, th there's nothing else. It was just really good. Now, I mean, it's not like the best Star Wars movie. You can't be that, really, in this day and age. But it was just really good and a great surprise, actually. It may have been a little worse than I uh, was anticipating, or it may have been a little better. I'm still trying to decide that months later. <laughs> okay, so next... We're gonna be talking about Incredibles 2, which I still can't believe exists and I have actually seen multiple times It's just kind of like wake me up. Obviously, this is a dream. There's no way but there is a way Because it happened. I actually walked into this movie with my expectations very low I knew there was no way on the planet earth that Pixar could possibly top the Incredibles Which is perhaps one of the greatest superhero films of all time, one of the greatest animated films of all time, one of the greatest films of all time. There was no way Pixar was possibly going to top that. And I'm super glad that I walked into the theater with those expectations, because they didn't, obviously. I mean, that that was to be expected. But what did surprise me is that they lived up to it. Pretty much everything in the film, with the exception of one particular thing, is an improvement over the first one. The character interactions, I feel, are better. The score, somehow Michael Giacchino managed to make the jazzy score of The Incredibles two times as good. Thirdly, the animation was just so insane. I could watch 
anything in this style and never get bored. I could watch this movie on repeat and never get bored. I could watch this movie muted and never get bored. There's just so much to look at, so many colors. Like, we were talking about colors for Infinity War and for Solo. Well, here, it blast those out of the park because this movie is just such a colorful explosion of happiness. I would compare the animation in this film to butter in a good way. Now, I, I mentioned that there was only one thing that this film didn't do better than the first one, and I think we all know what it is, the story. Even though, based on the trailers, I didn't think I really would, I actually really enjoyed the Elastigirl subplot. Or actually, I guess you could say it's the main plot. I enjoyed it for the most part. But what I enjoyed more was Mr. Incredible staying at home with the kids. And we'll get to the kids in a minute, because there's a lot to talk about there. Possibly the best part of the movie. Easily the best part of the movie. But uh, there is a villain plot twist, which of course, no spoilers, so we're not gonna get into full details. But there is a villain plot twist that is super super predictable and I mean it's okay there are far and I mean far too many great aspects of this movie for that con to outweigh them all it is an exceptional exceptional film okay we got to talk about the opening scene in the movie so brief opening scene spoilers it opens with Tony Reitinger getting interviewed by Rick Dicker and he's recounting the events of how he asked Violet on a date and then the underminer showed up and he saw her without her mask this is just such an amazing way to open a movie this is how you do it this was the only way they could have done it to make this movie super good it's one of it's probably my favorite part of the movie maybe not the underminer scene because there are better parts later on in the movie but like I mean just the way it opens up so it has the walt disney pictures logo and then the it's a new revamped one for incredibles 2 and the score just keeps rising up and you're like shaking and then freaking tony riding is just amazing everything with violet in this film amazing she's still one of my favorite incredibles actually i don't know if she actually was before the film but now she definitely is i mean i can't really pick because they're kind of a package deal but the point is everything that went on with the kids in this movie all three of them actually there's a lot more for violet and jack jack to do uh dash is kind of just doing math i love when mr incredible oh i'm not gonna spoil it the point is this movie is amazing it lived up to the original maybe exceeded it maybe maybe i'm like i said i'm still trying to process these films maybe there's no way maybe it's i'm not opposed to it next up in july we got the second mcu film this summer which was ant-man and the whoops unlike the other movies i've talked about i actually walked into this film with high expectations and there are two reasons for that there good reasons i hope first of all the first Ant-Man is one of my favorite MCU movies. And second of all, the trailers for this film are some of my favorite trailers of all time. The way the action is done, and we'll get to that in a minute, and to the music of It Takes Two, the trailers are just so good. Problem is, the best action scenes in the whole movie have already been shown in the trailers. People have talked about this problem for a long time, but I never really realized it until Ant-Man and the Whoops. No, it's actually Ant-Man and the Wasp. I'm just gonna keep going with that joke, aren't I? There weren't many exciting scenes at all in this movie that I had not already seen thanks to the trailers, and that really kind of sucked. The good news is most of the good humor in the film wasn't in the trailers, so there's still a lot of that to look forward to, but don't expect any great action scenes like the trailers because they're there, there's just nothing else. I think the reason I liked this one the least out of all the films this summer was simply because I had set my expectations so high. With all the other films, I was like, I cared about them so much that I didn't let myself get so hyped. But with this, I was like, I care about it and I'm excited for it. It, it may not be the most excited I've ever been for a movie, but I might as well say this is going to be freaking amazing. And it was... It was good. Out of all the films this summer, I loved four of them and liked one of them, and that was this film, which really, really sucks. But at the same time, it's super good. But at the same time, it's super bad. Ugh. Now, there is actually a central theme of daughter and father figure in this film, and I will talk about that in a future video essay because it is probably the best part of the film, and it is the only part of the film, spoiler-wise, that I really want to talk about, so... Look forward to that. And finally, we are here at the fifth movie, representing August, just came out a couple of weeks ago, Kenobi, A Star Wars Story. Now, I'ma be honest, I'm not exactly sure how talking stuffed animals fit into the current canon that Disney has established, but I'm all for it. I think they pulled it off kind of subtly, and it, it just, it worked actually surprisingly well. Now, the thing that I'm kind of skeptical on is how they were trying to introduce the Marvel Cinematic Universe and make them intertwined universes by introducing Agent Peggy Carter into this film. That was a little confusing. Like, I, I, I'll say Winnie the Pooh's in Star Wars, but 
Peggy Carter, that's that's kind of stretching it, Disney, but let's be real. My one complaint is probably the fact that there wasn't a single lightsaber in this entire movie. Also, everyone's calling Obi-Wan Christopher Robin, which, I don't know, that's just so confusing. I don't even know how to comprehend that. It's, it's too much for my mind to take. I've supported Disney and the canon for a long time, so, like, I've tried to keep up with everything that's going on, but this movie kind of pushed the boundaries a little. That being said, it was probably the best thing to come out of Star Wars since... The Last Jedi. Okay, Joko. All jokes aside, Christopher Robin may be my favorite film this summer. Like, I'm not even joking. I talked about how I tried to set my expectations low with the other films. This one, I didn't really have any expectations with at all. I love Winnie the Pooh, I love Ewan McGregor, so <laughs> the only thing this movie had to accomplish really was to make a good adaptation of Pooh as a character and have some sort of central theme that fits the whole Christopher Robin slash Winnie the Pooh story. So it had like two things to cover and it did and it went above and beyond that, which is one of the reasons it's so great. Whereas all the other films I've talked about have had to manage and balance so many other things. Infinity War had to balance so many characters, so many stories, it had to balance 10 years worth of films. Solo had to you know, tackle so many things that had to live up to everything that The Last Jedi had supposedly ruined. Old and Ehrenreich had to portray Han Solo in a good way. With The Credibles 2, they had to continue a story that had started 14 years earlier. With Ant-Man and the Wasp, they had all those things and more. But with Christopher Robin, like I said, it just had to be Christopher Robin. And it was Christopher Robin, and it was super good. Which is what makes it one of my favorite films this summer. Let's get into specifics, because you're probably like, how? How? Well, I'll tell you how. The cinematography in this film is amazing. We talked about the colors and the visuals and everything else, but that's different. This movie was kind of bland, but the cinematography and the visuals are different. Visuals refers to the color and the way things look, and cinematography refers to the certain shots and just the way it is shot overall, and this movie had it down to a science. Well, cinematography kind of is a science, but still, the point is this movie got it. You can take any frame from this film and hang it up on your wall, and it would be freaking amazing and your friends would come over and be like, where'd you get the Mona Lisa? Like, it, uh. They also managed to make these stuffed animals in the film look like real stuffed animals, but at the same time be the lively characters that they are in the Winnie the Pooh cartoons. While at the same time respecting the old books that inspired the cartoons that inspired Christopher Robin. Come to think of it, Christopher Robin did have quite a bit to live up to, but less of a toxic fan base than some of the other ones. Also, the message actually kind of fit me and my filmmaking career and my writing career, where sometimes just do nothing until you end up doing something. I needed to know that because, actually, <laughs> I'm just gonna save that for another video essay. So, um, I guess we're done here. The point is the theme fit me, the cinematography was amazing, they pulled off the characters, and of course, Ewan McGregor, I mean, come on, it's Ewan McGregor. There was no way this movie could fail, like, for real. If it weren't for Ewan McGregor, I would probably, probably hate the prequels, but I love them, mostly because of Ewan McGregor, so. He's just a good luck charm. Disney, maybe you can learn something and make an actual Kenobi a Star Wars story, or maybe you shouldn't. If you're going to, though, only do it if Ewan McGregor's in it, otherwise, you know, the Star Wars community is going to hate you forever. Alrighty, guys. That's a video. Thank you for the patience. I know it's been a while since my video where I said I was returning. I mean, not too long. You were probably expecting a video sooner, and I was really hoping to get it out even the day after. But just so many things ended up happening. I've even tried to script this. I've made several scripts. I filmed it once, and then I'm here filming it again. I kind of got sick at one point. I was out of town unexpectedly at one point. There was just so much going on. But I'm glad I finally was able to film it. Let's hope nothing goes wrong in editing. Thank you for staying subscribed. Thank you for listening to me. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. That was weird. I just thanked you and now I'm asking you to. But if you haven't, go ahead because there are so many exciting things coming up, including tons of video essays. And I'm just going to be talking about all sorts of stuff. So you are not going to want to miss it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And as always, hit that notification bell so that way you're notified. Also, in the comment section down below, tell me about your thoughts on these films and if you've seen them or if you haven't seen them and if you agreed with me and if you disagreed with me there's so many things to say i don't know also you may notice actually you didn't because i just realized that's out of the frame all of my really good pops are up there um so you're missing out but this bad boy i managed to get the cap and crunch pop that has nothing to do with the video but still felt like telling you there are so many good pops i mean like thanos like for real but anyway guys thank you so much for watching and no
Captain Crunch. I don't feel so good. 